Hi, this is Nick Freitas, and welcome back to Making the Argument. We have something a little bit different for you today. We're actually going to give you the audio and video of a speech that I delivered today on the campus of UVA in Charlottesville, Virginia, where the Young Americans Foundation was hosting a Back the Blue rally. Now, they did a lot of preparation and got a little bit of pushback from some of their fellow students as well as the administration, but they persevered and held the event, and I was very honored to attend. Uh, during this event, I had the opportunity to talk about what do we expect from law enforcement within a free society, and what are our responsibilities in order to make sure that we achieve it. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to pay tribute today to those men and women serving in uniform who daily put their lives on the line to protect us, to serve us, to represent, Lord, the best of uh, our American servants uh, who are loyal and, and, and seek to um, execute, Lord, their duties, Lord, day by day. Um, we thank you for their courage. We pray for wisdom, for strength. We pray, Lord, that uh, in concert with this psalm and the sentiment of that, that you would, Lord, remind them that you uh, are gu guarding them, that you are with them wherever they go. Lord, in the darkness of the night or in the early hours of the morning or throughout the day, Lord, that you, your presence, Lord, is there to guard and guide them. Uh, Lord, we thank you for their service. We thank you especially for their families. We thank you for their spouses, for their children, Lord, who know the risks that they take uh, day by day. And Lord, we thank you so much that they help protect us uh, and secure our liberties uh, uh, in all their service. And we thank you for the opportunity to pay tribute to them today. In your name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. That was beautiful. So I want to give Delegate Freitas a proper introduction because he is incredible. So, Nick enlisted in the United States Army after high school and served in the 82nd Airborne and 25th Infantry Division. After 9-11, he volunteered for the U.S. Army Special Forces, Green, sorry, Green Berets, and served two combat tours in Iraq. After leaving the military, Nick has worked as a subject matter expert and consultant on matters of national security to include counterterrorism, unconventional warfare, and counterinsurgency. In 2015, Nick was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates, where he serves on transportation, science, and technology committees. Nick and his wife, Tina, live in Culpeper with their three children, Lily, Luke, and Allie. So Nick supports students in so many schools, uh, the College Republicans chapter. He's supporting us today and has in the past. He's an incredible representative. If every representative in Virginia were like Delegate Freitas, Virginia would be the best state in the United States, that's for sure. So I would like everyone to give a very warm welcome to the Honorable Delegate Freitas. I can't remember who it was that said that was a very generous introduction. My, uh, my father would have enjoyed it, my mother would have believed it. <laughs> um, but, but thank you very much and, and thank you for what you're doing here today, obviously this is an issue which has increasingly become more controversial and one that I think it's, it says something about the state of where we are as a country and as a people that this is a controversial issue. And so I didn't want to just come and assume that everyone that was going to show up today was going to automatically agree with our premise, which is that the police are generally deserving of our support. And so I thought instead I'd talk a little bit about what do we expect from law enforcement in a free society? Anybody that knows where I stand philosophically on issues knows that I put an incredible premium on individual liberty. 
I, I think that's the defining feature of American culture is, Amer is individual liberty. Not because we've always lived up to it, but it's always been something that we've aspired to in order to protect and expand liberty to all people within our country. And a key component of that within law enforcement is the idea of not just protecting what the government wants done, but that fundamental connection to the idea that every human being has inherent worth and has a right to be able to live their life the way they want, provided that they don't infringe on the rights and liberties of others as they do so. And that is a core fundamental difference between the culture within law enforcement in this country and law enforcement that I have witnessed in countries and other parts of the world where the police really do serve at the exclusive behest of whoever happens to be in power, as opposed to the connection that I believe men and women in uniform have in this country within our law enforcement institutions, that connection directly to the people, that it is not us against them, that they are actually members of that community and see it as a sacred duty to respect that community. So what does back the blue mean when we say it? Because I do think some people have deliberately misinterpreted what it is we mean by it. We do not mean that a police officer which violates their sacred oath is somehow automatically entitled to respect because they wear the same uniform of all of the other officers that do not violate their oath. We see that as officers do as a betrayal. And when that happens, that needs to be confronted the way free people should confront authority when it goes outside of the constitutional boundaries for which it is supposed to operate. But I find it fascinating as we go through this debate about what should law enforcement look like, we can break society down almost into three generalized categories. There are some that don't want police at all. Now, I don't rightly understand how that's going to work. Okay, but... I, I'm willing to hear the arguments. I believe people have a right to believe what they want and express their ideas the way they would like to. Again, not sure how it's going to work. But then there's, there's two other categories. And within those two other categories, both sides believe that there is a need for the police. One side believes the law enforcement institutions are institutionally and systematically racist that essentially need to be built up from the ground up, that there's horrendous problems with respect to police brutality all throughout the country. And then there's another side of that, which I believe that most of us would probably fall into, which is the idea that there is no such thing as a perfect institution, that all institutions should strive for perfection, even if we recognize that we will probably never realize the ideal this side of heaven, that doesn't mean pursuing the ideal is not a worthwhile effort. But having said that, we also respect an institution and a profession where people willingly put their lives on the line in order to protect complete strangers. And just as we would not blame the entire institution of teaching for an educator that does something inappropriate with a student, nor do we judge the entire institution of law enforcement or everyone that wears the badge by the actions of those that violate that oath. So for the two groups that actually believe and agree that we do need law enforcement, I would like to run us through a thought exercise. Just a real quick thought exercise. I don't know what it's like to be a police officer, but I do know what it's like to be called into violent situations and to be going those situations not exactly knowing what I was going to find when I got there. And so let's think about what an officer hears when they're in their cruiser and the call comes over the radio of an armed robbery, shots fired, and they know that they are close enough to be able to get there in time to potentially prevent that person or apprehend that person. They know they can get there in time. They're close enough. So what goes through their mind? Well, on any given day and in the best circumstances possible, and this is something I do know about, here's what you think about. Your first thought is actually not for yourself. It's, am I going to get my partner killed? Am I going to do something that is going to put me in a situation where I am now going to have to go and confront the spouse of someone that I have spent a great deal of time training with, operating with, getting to know, going to barbecues with, and am I going to have to explain to their spouse and their children that the reason why their mother or father is not coming home is because I didn't do what I was supposed to do in the right situation? That's the first thing. Then you start to think about other people on the objective, other people in the environment. What is going to happen? What, what is going to happen if I get there in time? What's going to happen if I don't get there in time? Am I going to have to kill somebody today? Not because I want to, 
but out of sheer necessity and the desire to protect my partner, the other innocent people in that area, and myself, am I going to actually have to take a human life? And once you've thought through all of that, then you finally get to yourself and wonder, am I going to see my kids again? What will happen to my kids when I'm no longer to be there for them? Will they resent me for it? And it's not as if this, this is a, a contemplation or an introspection that takes place over the course of hours. This is something that flashes through your minds in moments as you are going to that area and you know that something bad is about to happen because it's already happening. And you're the one that has been called to bring order out of chaos. That is what you think about under the most ideal circumstances. Now let's consider what our officers are thinking about today. Once they've gotten through all of that, now they have to wonder, what happens if I show up and I do have to shoot this person? What happens if I show up and I have to use violent or deadly force in order to protect other people? And I am doing so in complete compliance with what, I, what policy is, I'm doing so with the absolute best intentions in order to do everything I can to preserve life. But if I have to choose between someone that is attempting to hurt or kill the innocent or protecting them, then I'm going to protect the innocent. Here's what will happen. Your picture will be plastered on the news. Your name will most likely go out to the public. It doesn't take very long now for someone to find out what your address is, where your kids go to school, where your wife works. There's going to be an incredible degree of scrutiny if there's other components that factor in, based off of what's going on now, which is the social concerns and arguments and debates that we're having, that will also factor into the reasoning and you will be tried in the court of public opinion before anybody has revealed body cam footage, has heard your perspective, or what you saw, or what you were confronted with when you showed up. All of that will already be decided by a number of people that have no idea what it is like to ever be called into one of those situations. So you get the call, or you just wait five minutes, and you don't show up. And yeah, the guy gets away, and you've got to write a report. Sure, there'll be an investigation, but you're not going to be on the news. You're not going to have to worry about your kids getting harassed at school. You're not going to have to worry about your spouse getting harassed at work. You're not going to have to worry if your entire reputation is completely destroyed. You're not going to have to worry about if you lose your pension. You don't have to worry about any of it. Just took a little longer to get there. That's all, boss. What sort of police officer do we want in that situation as a free society? Because I want the one that's going to show up and defend the innocent. And while as a free people, we have a right to expect the best out of those who put on a badge and defend us, I do think they have a reasonable expectation that when they are called into a dangerous situation and they have to make life-changing decisions within split seconds, that we will at least give them the benefit of the doubt and review facts and evidence within context. Because if we're not willing to do that, what right or expectation do we have for a complete stranger to risk everything on our behalf? Now, as we consider this, there are two different ways to approach it. There are many in the media and within academia and with various interest groups that have already decided what they think and what they believe regardless of any thought exercise that have put before them, any new perspective that they may not have considered, it doesn't matter, they have already drawn, the, drawn their conclusion. The police are the enemy. That is their conclusion. They will be swayed by little else. But then there's another group. And this was perhaps best personified by a civil rights activist, a reverend in Arizona, who was leading marches, calling for greater accountability, calling for reform because of an incident that took place within his community. And his local law enforcement asked him if he would be willing to participate in a shoot-no-shoot -shoot 
training exercise. And to his credit, he took him up on it. He didn't retreat back to the echo chamber. Police were willing to give him a different perspective and he took it. And when he went through the training, what he realized was how difficult that decision can be in split seconds with so much on the line. And there was times where he made good decisions and there was times where he made bad decisions. There was times where he shot someone that was unarmed because that person posed a threat. And when he was asked what he got out of it, he didn't become any less an activist on behalf of his community or in favor of getting the best police department possible. But he respected the new information that he had been given and it modified the way he thought and the way he talked about it. That is a person that is serious in this debate. Because let's face it, there's a lot of other people that are there for power, that are there for money, but are not there because they have the best interests of the community or the police to protect them in mind. And the question that we're all going to have to ask is where do we fall in that equation? Are we willing to listen to different perspectives? Are we willing to take into account somebody else's experience that might not agree with our own or might not comport to our own predispositions? That is supposed to be what universities like UVA are about. And I will be honest with my own experience because my father was LAPD for 20 years. And I'll never forget at different nights where he'd get called up at two o'clock in the morning and I'd wake up and watch my dad get ready and rush out the door and you wonder if you're gonna see him again. I will also never forget as his retirement where the family of a victim who had had their sister and their two nieces brutally murdered by the father show up to my father's retirement in order to thank him for helping them achieve justice. So yes, I am predisposed to defending and standing by those who risk so much to protect people that they've never met. Not because I don't believe we should hold them to the highest account, but if we truly want that level of commitment, then they're not the only ones with the responsibility in this. We are too. And I will stand by anybody that will work to achieve a better environment for our citizens and for the men and women that protect them. So thank you to YAF for putting this on, for having the courage to put this on. And thank you to our men and women in blue that support us.